Hey, grab your Bibles and find Ecclesiastes chapter 10. We are going to cover two chapters today, um, Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and, and chapter 11. Now, to be honest, we could just spend one sermon on each one, but to me, in terms of the search, the way the sermon series has laid itself out, um, I'm going to flow right in from one chapter um, to the next. And so what's going to happen here is, is we're going to read the first few verses in chapter 10 and get down to around chapter, uh, verse 4, and it's going, to tw- it's going to quickly change, if you will. It's like a key verse that sort of sends us into the main point um, of where we're headed. I'm going to deal with that alone. I think there's one area um, in chapter 10 that relates to our lives that we could all improve upon and, and exercise wisdom in that area, which allows us to walk right into chapter 11 and understand how to live that out and how just to trust God. So we're going to learn, hopefully and prayerfully, we're going to learn this today, how to enjoy living in the sovereignty of God. And you say, wow, that's, that's a big word. It's a big topic. Honestly, the song we just sang is perfect. To, to live in the sovereignty of God is found in those two sentences. I will rest in the Father's hands and leave the rest in the Father's hands. That right there is, is the posture that is stated of what does it mean to fully enjoy, rest, and live in, um, in the sovereignty of God. And so the title of the sermon, you're going to see in just a moment, is I Pity the Fool. And I didn't know how many people remember Mr. T, but I had a lot of folks coming out, oh, Mr. T. And I was like, thank you. I, I like the A-team back in the 70s. But everybody's going, wait, what? When were the 70s? God, Pastor Ron, are you like 90? Whatever, right? But what? moving on. Um, I love that, right? And many of you probably, literally Solomon is making that statement over and over. He literally is saying here, like, I pity the fool um, in this area, like for for you to not understand the wisdom of God, for you to not see the hand of God, believer or unbeliever. And in our journey with Solomon, this is where he's sort of brought us. Now, chapter 10 and somewhat chapter 11, but mostly chapter 10 reads like a graduation speech. So when someone of life experience or or noted life achievement is typically invited into a college, high school, university setting, whatever, to give the the baccalaureate speech or the graduation speech, um, and it's sort of, here's what I've learned from life, and here's how you at your age can grab the most out of it. That's really what chapter 10 sounds like. And then he switches into um, chapter 11 and really just says, In short, again, I'm going to rest in the Father's hands and leave the rest in the Father's hands. So as I said, we're going to learn how to just literally enjoy living the life that God has called us to live. So when we start out in chapter 10, so you pay attention and can easily track. In the first few verses, he's going to to sort of give us his wisdom on actions. Uh, And then he's going to move to process. Like if you express wisdom in your actions, this is what will happen. If you express wisdom in processes... This is what will happen. And then if you learn to express wisdom with your words, which is where I want to spend the most time on chapter 11, uh, chapter 10, because that's where most of the verses are designated to, and it's right in the middle. He builds up to it, spends time on words, then goes away from it, then comes back to it in chapter 11. I think the area that most of us can improve upon is speaking this life that God has given us into existence. Now, hang on. If you know anything about me, I am not a prosperity gospel preacher, and meaning I'm not a pink Cadillac kind of a guy. Like, if you just go out there and win the most souls to Christ, God's going to give you a pink Cadillac kind of a thing, right? I don't believe God's an insurance salesman. I don't believe it's in sort of this meritorious system. God has already done everything he needs to do for you, and you are at your worst. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. So there's nothing more I can claim out there than to claim the victorious Christian life. So I'm not, an, I'm not a name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, prosperity type gospel, but I don't want you to get confused when I say you need to learn how to begin speaking life and blessing into your current life. There are so many people that I meet that that will tell you, oh, I'm a positive person. Like, Pastor Ron, you know me. I'm positive. I'm positive the world's going to blow up tomorrow. You know, you're like, well, okay, Eeyore. I didn't think you knew you were Eeyore. But, right, there are so many people that tell you they're positive, but the opposite comes out of their, out of their mouth. And then they can't understand why. They're surrounded by so much negativity because they haven't taken the time to listen to their own speech that their own negative speech has literally walked them into only seeing the negative that's around them. And so here Solomon is saying, look, in your actions, in your processes, with your words, this is how you claim life and death, blessing and cursing. The previous message, Deuteronomy chapter 30, God was speaking through Moses and he says, listen, I've put before you today blessing and cursing, life and death. You get to choose. 
And we know from other passages that the Bible tells us that our, our mouth, right, either speaks blessing or it speaks cursing. So you and I need to learn how to literally frame our vocabulary and maybe that changes what's already inside because remember, the Christian life is a lot like a water pump, really, like what's down inside eventually comes out, okay? So you and I need to learn how to appropriate what's in us and speak the life that God has given us so we can begin to see God, whether we're in the valley or whether we're on the mountaintop, we begin to see God at work around us and we trust the sovereignty of God. So I can literally say, God, I'm gonna rest in the Father's hands. My world, my head, my emotions, situations, events, relationships, all of that around me may be somewhat um, chaotic, uh, difficult, uh, up and down, unstable, but nonetheless, because you're sovereign, like you are the creator of the universe, and Lord, because of that, I'm going to rest in the Father's hands. And Lord, because of that, I can't figure everything else out. And because you are Alpha and Omega, right, I'm going to leave the rest in the Father's hands. You know, a lot of this, I don't know what I'm going to say until I say it. Um, and so after the nine, I was just thinking through some things. And um, when my girls were younger, I just remember, you know, they're older now, right? And their steps are bigger and their, uh, their decisions are, are guarded and, and they're making their own decisions in so many ways on a daily basis. But it took me back, the sermon after nine took me back to when my girls were so little and they never really looked up. They're like as little kids, right? They're just pouncing on puddles and they're running everywhere. And as parents, you're just like, okay, honey, come back this way. Okay. And as long as like mom and dad are there, they feel free to just like step on puddles and walk around and just, you know, can't, can't you just see the little toddlers just doing that? But somehow they know when like mom and dad aren't paying attention, they're like, they look around. As long as I know my God is on the throne, I can walk around and just step on puddles all day long. And I can just trust that big daddy's around, Right? that God's going to take care of me. I'm going to rest in the Father's hands and leave the rest in the Father's hands. So if you will, join me um, in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. In just a moment, I'm going to read uh, pretty much the whole chapter so you understand where we're headed. But before we get there, I want you to listen to Proverbs 21, verse 23. Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Isn't that the truth? How many times have you and I tripped over our own tongue? How many times have we ate peppermint socks, right? Like I just inserted my mouth, uh, my foot in my mouth and just there it was. How many times has that passage come true? So what we're gonna find out is again, Solomon walks us through actions, processes, words, how to express wisdom. Then that leads us into chapter 11 on how to rest in the absolute sovereignty of God. With that in mind, just follow me along, follow along with me as I begin in verse one. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. Notice the next sentence. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. Now, some of these are a sermon in themselves, and this is just one of them. So me, what he's about to do is imagine he's given sort of a baccalaureate speech. And he's saying, look, there's, there's, you can smell good all day long, but people down inside know when you're not good. Uh, you, 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 know, you can smell better than what your character actually is. But also there's a point that's made here that have you ever noticed you can stand around and talk clean, pure, moral, if you will, but all it takes is somebody to tell a dirty joke and that attracts more of a crowd than, than actual clean, pure talk. As a matter of fact, if you study social media platforms, there are people out there that are speaking untruth and instability and immorality, and they have tens of millions of followers. The best, most popular preacher, if you will, might have two to three million followers. Like a, a 10 to one following, people would rather listen to filth rather than they would to truth. That's exactly what he's saying here. That all it takes is one little dirty joke to be inserted and more people will flock to that than they will flock to truth and, and wisdom and honor. Verse two, a wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Even when the fool walks on the road, I love this verse, okay? A lot of commentators here speculate if this was actually written with a satirical uh, mindset. I tend to think it was because remember, Solomon now has gone this journey and he's at the end of the road. And after all, he's the wisest man in the world. And he's had a lot of people around him that have talked to him whether they knew he was the wisest man or not. And he says, look, I've been down that road and all your jibber jabber right now is only just expressing how much of a fool you are. Have you ever felt like that or have you ever been in a situation like that 
where you just kept talking and talking and talking only to find out the person that you were talking to was like so smart in that area and you were like, oh, like I should have shut my mouth a long time ago, right? That's literally what he says, that a fool just goes on talking and talking and talking and he lacks the sense. He says to everyone, like everything that he's doing is announcing that he's a fool, but down deep inside, what he's trying to do is put on this perfume on the outside that makes everybody think he's got life figured out, but just by his speech, by his actions, by his processes and his words, those around him know, oh, this guy, this girl absolutely doesn't know what they're doing. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place. For calmness will lay great offenses to rest. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were, an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. Now he's talking about processes. Like before you begin to go do something, consider the danger, consider the outcome. Don't just rush into it because I've actually seen smart people do dumb stuff, and I've seen dumb people act smarter than the, than the smart, right? This is what he, consider the process. And then he says in the next verse, verse 10, like if you're, sometimes you can work harder, not smarter. The analogy, this is where this comes from. If, if he who quarries stones is hurt by them and he who splits logs is endangered by them, if the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. Now, this next verse is actually the key verse in all of chapter 10. It sounds a little odd and it may even sound out of place but it's the transition verse that wraps up where we've come from, now takes us through the rest of the chapter. It even sets up chapter 11. Here it is. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. Meaning sometimes you and I can think and act like we've got the system figured out. We can charm our way. We can manipulate our way. We can, we can look good and smell good. Verse one, we can look good and smell good. But down deep inside, we were unaware of all the circumstances that we've not outsmarted. And it just so happens that at that moment, what we tried to manipulate, it bites us before we can ever turn the situation. And he says, this is, what, this is the result of it. You sort of talked your way into a game that you're not ready to play. And now you're exposing yourself as a fool. Here's how he says it in verse 12. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what it is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him. The toil of a fool wearies him. Now, that's interesting insight. Even a fool knows that he's only trying to talk his way either into, out of, or around a situation. And even a fool is tired of all the talking. That this is madness to them. That down deep inside, they know that it's just words to them at this point. That it's not actually life. That even a fool is tired of the life that he's living. For he does not know the way to the city. Meaning, look, this guy's been there this whole time, right? But he's just, he's literally surrounded by the answer but he can never find the answer because all he does is talk foolish talk. It's right there in front of him the whole time. And again, this is sort of satirical language. Verse 16, woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobility and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through sloth, the roof sinks in and through indolence, the house leaks. Bread is made for laughter and wine gladdens life and Money answers everything. Even in your thoughts, do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich. For a bird, listen, for a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature will tell the matter. Have you ever thought you were telling a secret or you were sharing gossip only to find out you were heard? I'll never forget when Rain and I were, um, we'd been married, of course, just three years and the neighborhood that we uh, lived in, everybody was pregnant at the same time. Like we were all 20. 28 years of age, we were all pregnant, and apparently we bought we all bought the same baby monitoring system. I don't know if this has ever happened to anybody, but there were 10 other of the same, and I'm upstairs changing the diapers, right? I'm upstairs, and I hear somebody going, yeah, well, you know, just buy the beans and this and that, and I'm like, what in the world is Raina talking about? 
And I'm like, what? I'm, I was like, say what, Raina? She's like, I didn't say anything. I'm taking it out. I'm like, oh, what, what was that? And finally, Raina figures it out. You could hear all the other houses, the parents, the families talking to each other. You literally could hear like, oh, this and that. And sometimes you'd hear some pretty, you know, interesting things. And so finally, we had to tell everybody like, I think we're all on the same system. And they were like, yeah, we were wondering whose voice that was in the bedroom. It was the weirdest thing. What it's saying is often you think you're trying to gossip or tell a secret or Share some sort of foolish talk only to find out that eventually it gets back to the person. What is he saying? He's saying, watch your words. Why is it important for you and I to watch what we say? This is in your notes. Why is it important why you and I should watch what we say? Number one, my tongue always directs where I go. Not so much your steps, not so much your intentions, your beliefs, or your, 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 your statements, if you will, your convictions, it's your tongue. We've already read Ecclesiastes 10, but look, look at James chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. When we put bits in the mouths of horses, we can turn the whole animal. Isn't that amazing? A thousand pound horse, 2,000, 2,500 pound, whatever, whatever the horse might weigh, that one little bit can turn the entire horse. Do you know your mouth the same way? You and I may act one way, but the tongue can actually set our life on a different, different direction. You may profess to be a believer in some area. You may profess to be a follower of Christ. You can even come here on a Sunday morning and sing these songs. I will, I will rest in the Father's hands, and I will leave the rest in the Father's hands. But as soon as you get out there and you have a flat tire, what are you doing? Well, so much for the Father's hands, right? That's what he's saying here. He's saying you and I must watch where we go because our tongue directs that. Verse 4 or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants it to go. So I didn't have any idea that this would possibly relate in the message, but recently Rain and I, we really enjoy kayaking, so we found one online, you know, sale, whatever, went and picked it up, and we got a kayak, and it came with a rudder. I was like, well, this is cool. You know, it's 13 foot long, it's a little flat, it's more of a fishing kayak, but um, anyway, we, we bought it, and and so we're out there, and we're going up this one uh, spring, and the, the current was really strong. We knew it was, but it was stronger than normal. And typically, I can let Raina rest. I'm like, I got this. You know, like, come on, I'm the man. What do you know? And, uh, but that day, she, we all had to help. And I'm like, all right, you, you just keep going. And I was like, oh, wait, I got an, a, a rudder. And so the current would come, and it would just push us over this way. And we're just we're stroking and stroking and stroking. And I was like, all right, all right you just keep stroking. I'm going to try the rudder. So I put the rudder. And right, amazing. I'm like, oh, well, look at that. And it would, it would help us get out of that current. Like, wow, so is your tongue. Your tongue is just like a rudder. You may want to go one way, but listen to me. If you're talking another way, your tongue determines and sets the direction of where you're going to walk. So what do we do? You, you simply need to ask for and apply wisdom. James chapter 1, verse 5. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him seek and ask of God, and he will give liberally. You and I must learn how to use our tongue appropriately. So I'm telling you, so many times I hear it so often in so many little ways, like parents to children, oh, well, I knew she wouldn't do good, or she's so shy, or, or he is this, or he is that. And you think they're just, you think they're not listening. You think they're just counting petals on a flower, right? And not looking up and they're hearing every word you say. So if you're already saying your child is not this or your child is not that, they're already absorbing that and believing that. So many times, even about yourself, you'll, you'll say things like, well, I knew I wouldn't get the job or I knew this would happen. And I, I, I was po right. I'm a positive person. I was positive. I was going to be, uh, you know, not get the salary. I was, was going to get left over for the promotion or sweat to buy. I, I knew the results would come back like this. You and I are so, I'm not a name it and claim it, but so many times we're guilty of like my grandfather said, so many people live for Christ on Sunday and the devil on Monday. We can come in here and sing these songs, right? Like, I will leave the rest in the Father's hands. But as soon as Monday morning hits, oh, we take it right back. No, you and I need to say, okay, God, listen, you are Alpha and Omega. You are the creator of the universe. You're in charge of this. There's nothing happening in my world or this world right now where you're having to say, I did not anticipate that. You are in charge of everything. So if that's the case, like a little kid, I can walk around and just step on puddles because you're in charge, not me. But God, as I'm walking in this world, 
I need you to give me wisdom on how to process, on my actions, how to use my words. Like, Father, set that over my mouth. Show me how to appropriately speak. Why? Well, here's the next thing. You and I need to understand that my tongue can destroy what I have. Gary Chapman says it this way, a marriage counselor. He says, many a good marriage was ruined today because of yesterday. Two husbands were joking, and, and one guy said, my wife is absolutely historical. He says, don't you mean hysterical? He said, no, historical. She reminds me of everything I've ever done wrong, right? You and I can constantly bring up things, and we can destroy so many todays because of yesterday. You can destroy what you have by your tongue. Listen to the book of James chapter 3. Verse 5 says it this way. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also fire. Everybody in here has been a victim of somebody spitting out fire on them. Whether it's an insult or a rejection or a cut down or a cut back or, right, or just that slight of tongue, as they say. You, you need to understand your tongue can destroy what you have. This is why Solomon says, watch your words because your words determine how your actions. It determines how you process things. It determines your application of wisdom. So in this instance, what do we got to do? We got to bite our tongue. You literally have to learn how to bite your tongue. The psalmist says it this way. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door. Notice this of my lips. Two different things. He says, number one, set a guard over my mouth. Like literally, Lord, like let my teeth bite my tongue before something comes out that shouldn't. Whether it's negative or whether it's against the will of God or right, like set that guard. But the next thing he says is, is put a door. Like in other words, there are, there are, my words can be either open doors or closed doors. And so Lord, guard that door. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Listen to Psalm 19 and verse 14. Let the words of my mouth, now pay attention to the next part. Let the words of my mouth and the, of my, listen, words don't just happen. Words are a result of a thought that started in your mind that was embedded in your heart and then came out of your mouth. Because you contrived some thought, whether negative or, or, or you held on to some statements that were said or whether you just thought it yourself, right? It, words don't just happen. They, they start as a result of thoughts that fire off in your brain that then resonate with your heart. It's down inside and then it comes out. Listen, only what's inside comes out of. And so what you're already speaking reveals the product of your heart. It's like a water pump. I expect when I go to a water pump, if you've ever used one, I don't expect orange juice to come out. I expect water to come out, right? I don't expect dirt to come out. Well, Lord willing, I hope not, but right? I expect I'm going to pump that and water is going to come out of the water spout. Whenever I open my mouth, whatever's down deep inside is going to come out. And you and I can't hide that. So we have to ask the Lord, put a guard Guard that door of my lips. Why do we have to do this? Number three, because my tongue displays who I am. Your tongue. You and I can dress. We can act. We can process. We can manipulate. We can look good on the outside. Perfume smell good on the outside. But literally, our, our tongue is what displays who I am. Whenever you go to the doctor and you do a physical checkup, what's one of the first things they do? They grab that popsicle stick and say what? And stick out your tongue and say, that's where they look. Even if, you go to, even if you go to holistic doctors, they'll look at the color of your tongue and teeth impressions around your tongue and all, all the, I'm like, the tongue tells, me, tells you that much? And they're like, yeah, I've never noticed the color of my tongue until now, right? Well, that's exactly what the word of God is saying. My tongue displays who I am. Listen to the Bible in James 3. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Again, like my grandfather said, we live for God on Sunday and the devil on Monday. We sit here and sing these songs, take notes in our Bible, but then we go right back out. And if we're not careful, we'll speak negativity into our marriage, into our job, into relationships. We'll literally walk ourselves into situations with our mouth that we shouldn't be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? 
Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? No, so what's the problem? The problem's the heart. That's why he says in that verse, he tells you now in the meditation of my heart and the meditation of my heart. Most pastors quote that verse before they get up and preach. I know I do. I still do. I'm like, Holy Spirit, if I haven't confessed any sin, Lord, can I, you're invited into this place. I conf- I'm like, I am excited to preach your word, but these are not my words. These are your words. So Father, override my excitement and you speak your words through me. Let it be your mouth and not mine. Like God, in other words, clean out my heart before I stand up and preach your word. Why? Matthew 12, verse 34. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Wow. This is so important. So what do we have to do? Think before you speak. Think before you speak. You and I have to literally process what, what's going to happen if I say this around me to others? What sort of course of direction are these words that I'm about to share? What is that course going to put me on? Is that where I want to go? God, help me to think before I speak. The Bible says it this way, James 1.19, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Have you ever noticed that when you back that verse up, the reason why I'm angry is because I was hurried in my speech and I was hurried in my listening? I just want to hear what I want to hear. I don't want any advice from others. Listen, when I first started pastoring, I I was excited for my first little pastoral counseling session, right? I had my minors in psychology and my majors in religious education in in college. And I was was so excited. Like, oh, you got your first? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I came in. I was like, I was so ready. Like, I listened for two minutes and I gave 30 minutes of advice. And I thought, I solved their problems. Done. Thank you so much for coming, Pastor Ron. You know? (laughs) Right, like only to find out one, they didn't listen to a word I said, and then two, I didn't listen long enough to actually process what it was. I was so ready, and I found out two things: one, people don't really want answers to their questions; they more want somebody to talk to. And honestly, the the more that I listen, the more I find out. And I tell pastors this all the time: like if you will listen long enough, people will tell you everything you want to know. All you got to do is just sit back and listen. But for us, for most of all we want to do is talk, 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 and we just forget about the world that's around us. You and I are called to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And now listen, if we do all of that, it honestly allows you and I to understand and rest in the sovereignty of God. Our world is out of control and will be out of control until Christ returns and establishes peace. But in the midst of a world that's out of control, believers can actually have peace. Jesus said that, my peace I give you, my peace I leave with you. So we know we can be people of peace and full of peace in a world that is chaotic. What is the key to that? The key to that is obviously, number one, monitoring your speech because that determines your actions and your processes and how you're gonna walk in life, your direction, who you are, where you're headed, and how you view life. Well, your mouth walks you either into or out of resting in the sovereignty of God. And this is the way he says it. Turn over to chapter 11 and let's pick up at verse one. Cast your bread upon the waters. I'm gonna explain all of this, okay? For you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven. And if seven doesn't work, what he's saying is, or even to eight. For you know not what disaster may happen on earth. In other words, quit giving excuses to serve God. Literally, quit giving excuses. Well, I haven't prayed for this, and I haven't prayed for that, and I haven't heard an answer. Sometimes you don't need an answered prayer for everything. God has called you to enjoy life, to share with others, to invite people to faith in Christ. There are some things you don't have to pray about. You just go out and just do. One of them, and God says, you just wake up every day and serve me. What you do pays your bills, but who you are is a minister in Jesus Christ. You do not have to get up and pray, God, can you use me today? God has already said the the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. God has already ordered you to go out and serve people. You don't have to pray for that. You just say, God, use me today. Like, I'm here. I know you want to. I'm available. And just watch what God does. And if if seven people doesn't work, then serve eight people. And just cast that bread of the water and just live your life full of joy. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. If a tree falls to the south or to the north, 
in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. No more excuses. There are some people that literally, literally view Christianity like they put their finger in their mouth and go, okay, God, which way is the wind blowing? All right, I'm going to go that way. Right, Lord, today, if you, want, if you want to do this, I pray tomorrow that this happens. If this happens, then I know what's your will. Some things, you don't have to pray that. You literally just, no more excuses. You just get up and trust God, the sovereign God. Verse five, as you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. I love that. I love that. Like, Conception is an absolutely amazing thing and watching God build the life of a baby in the womb of a mom. And he says, so you don't know how that works either. You don't know how I work, but I make everything. In the morning, sow your seed and in the evening, withhold not your hand for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Light is sweet and is pleasant for the eye to see the sun. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes as vanity. Now, here it is. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. In other words, you just get up every morning and say, God, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I am going to live for you because you are living in me and for me, and I have nothing to lose. Like, even if I'm in the valley, I still have nothing to lose because you're still the God of all creation. Like, the day that I wake up and the headlines say, God is dead, what now? Then I need to worry, but we'll never have to worry about that because our God can't die, right? We know. Are y'all with me? All right, thank you. All right, just checking, just checking, all right? Verse verse 7, light is sweet and is pleasant for the sun. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember that days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. And let your heart cheer in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways and the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Verse 10, remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body. For youth and the dawn of life are vanity. In other words, live your life now as God gave it to you. Trust in the sovereignty of God and live every day absolutely to the fullest. How do we enjoy the sovereignty of God? Now, to be honest with you, the stuff I'm about to give you might sound Pollyanna, like fake, right? Like I'm just faking it till I make it. It's, to me, one of the easiest ways I think I can express and explain how to enjoy the sovereignty of God. Here it is. You and I need to learn how to trust God and brush your teeth. You say, what in the world does that mean? You can see it on the screen. Like sometimes you, you, you don't need to get up every day and say, Lord, do I need to do this? You just need to wake up. In other words, do what you know to do. Like get up, make your bed, get up, brush your teeth, get up, put your clothes on, get up and go out to work. You just, get, just literally get up and trust God and brush your teeth. You trust God and do what you know you need to do because you're living in the absolute sovereignty of God. You are not the creator of the universe. You did not wake up and God did not consult you on what was about to happen today. You literally woke up in the sovereignty of God where God is in control of everything and this you know you will never lose when you walk and breathe and live in the sovereignty of God. So get up, trust God, brush your teeth, walk out the door and say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So many people are like, God, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I go here? Some things you don't have to pray about. When I was in college, we learned this lesson. We'd always finish our, you know, classwork around 1130 or 12 and Waffle House was always open 24 hours. So 15 minutes away, Waffle House, like every night, like $3, biscuits and biscuits and gravy, you know, that's why I gained a lot of weight, whatever, you know, anyway, right afterwards and we would go, well, one night we invite my friend Michael and he's like, I got to pray. Does God want me to go to Waffle House? We're like, What? $3 biscuits and gravy? You ain't got to pray about that, man. Let's go. (laughs) Like, come on, man. We're broke. Three bucks. And that's, yeah, right? And Lily, every time we go somewhere, we're like, we're going to go to Burger King. We're going to go here. We're going to go there. He's like, I got to. And I thought, well, that sounds really holy, but then it's actually not. So many people get locked down in living for God because they think they have to pray about every little thing. Now, probably five, six months from now, you're going to hear me say something like this. Be very specific in your prayers. Are you contradicting yourself? No, I'm not. You don't have to pray like, Lord, should I, should I get up and serve you today? Yes. 
Lord, do I walk in your sovereignty? Absolutely. Lord, I don't like my job and my boss is this or the employees are this or the environment's this and this is that and this is that. Well, you might just be the only light in that job and that job may stink for a moment, but number one, it's at least paying your bills and number two, it's giving you a reason to get out and work your hands. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 11, right? If the roof sags, it's, it's the, because of lazy hands, like get out there and work, right? If you're praying for a job, don't wait for the perfect job. Like go out and get a job that may not be the perfect job until you get a job. I mean, there's some things you don't have to pray about. Lord, I'm hungry. Lord, I want the perfect job. God's like, just go deliver pizzas, right? Until I've taken so many jobs I didn't like, but it did what it needed to do until God opened doors for others. There are some things you don't need to pray about. Just trust God and brush your teeth. Take a trip and take a nap. Literally, some days you just need to say, okay, God, family, we're going to cancel everything. Like, I know we're supposed to get up and mow the yard, but today we're not going to mow the yard. The grass will be there tomorrow. We're going to go to the park. Some days you just don't need to be so busy. Some days you're just like, you know what? We're going to take a nap today. I used to love Sunday naps. Anybody love Sunday naps? Right? You know, sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. That was like religious in my family. I mean, we were, we were, listen, we were from the South. We would come home and fried chicken, mashed potatoes, green beans, take a nap, then watch NASCAR. Literally, that was my Sunday right? But we would take a nap every Sunday. Sometimes you just need to say, we're going to stop. Our family needs rest. Our schedule's vicious. Our schedule's rough. Sometimes, you know what? Don't worry about the homework right now. Let's take a 30-minute nap. It's okay. Right? Just take a trip and take a nap. Here's another way to say it. Live large. My dad used to say that all the time. My dad, he'd say, have a large day. <laughs> and I'm like, what does that mean? I just live. Just have a great day. Live large. Have fun with holiness. So many people, when they think about holiness, now listen, there is an awe, there is a reverence, there is a respect to God, but the, the, the Christian life isn't robotic. I love Jesus, do you? Will you go to heaven? I pray you do. I do. You know, the Christian life shouldn't be robotic, nor is the Christian life the second best life. The Christian life is the best life. Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. All you got to do is go to the beach during spring break time and find out people aren't really happy. They're actually miserable. They're just doing stupid stuff to make themselves think they're happy, right? All you got to do is show up at happy hour. There's nobody ever happy at happy hour. Everybody happy hour sitting around like this. I mean, right? You know, you know what I mean? Like you and I just, <laughs> Pat, anyway, moving on. Have fun with holiness. Christians ought to be the happiest, most joy-filled people in the world, even in the midst of a valley. Lost people in a valley don't know another mountaintop's coming. They don't know they're going to get out of it. Christians know that because there is a sovereign God, that God, for whatever reason, is allowing or, they've, or he's architected this valley. But there's a mountaintop coming. There is a time and a season for everything. The lost people don't have that view. You and I, no matter mountain, valley, or, or, or river, whatever, you and I just know we are full of joy in this life. The Christian life is not the second best life. It is the first class life especially when I can trust in the absolute sovereignty of God. What do I do? Spread out my energy. Spread out my time, my blessings, and my resources. That's what he says. Cast your bread upon the water. In other words, find people you can help. Find people you can bless. Because you know, if I get wrapped up into my world, then I want to be blessed. It's pity poor me. Why does no one help me? But have you ever, I've ever found that when you go out and help others, that's when you forget about your needs. He says, cast that bread upon the water. Spread out that energy. Here's some examples. Go zip lining. Go to Gatorland and zip line over gators, whatever. You know. Kayak, ride a bull, depend upon your age. Play in dirt with your kids. These are just examples I'm giving you. Just go out and live the abundant life in Christ. Holiness does not keep you inside fearful that the world's gonna fall. Holiness says, my God is absolutely in charge, and he's put me in charge, Genesis chapter 3, to have dominion of this earth, so I'm going to go out and have fun in the world that God has created because I live in the absolute sovereignty of God. My God is not dead. My God is alive. My God is orchestrating everything, so in this world, I don't live with fear. In this world, I rest in the Father's hands, and I'm going to leave the rest in the Father's hands. How do we do that? Find God everywhere. Is it not true you can wake up? I mean, like right now, you can open up your phone and you, you, will, you have to scroll through your social media feed to find good news. Bombings, displacements, sex trafficking, murders, 
police officer shot, a husband shoots wife, wife shoots husband, kids left. You just name, name the disasters. You and I, if we're not careful, all we will ever read is where God is not moving and we become even more accustomed to not finding God than we are accustomed to finding God. You need to start learning how to find God everywhere in the littlest of areas, not just only the big areas. Find out where God is working. Don't be what I would call a stock market Christian. You're up one day and you're down the next. You're up one day and you're down the next. Very volatile life. No, learn how to trust and invest in the sovereignty of God and just absolutely enjoy life. There it is. Enjoy life. Live with wisdom. Honor God with every, here it is. This is why I think in chapter 10, he talks so much about words. Enjoy life with every breath you have. Yeah, the winds are gonna blow. Chapter 10, chapter 11. The winds of life are gonna blow. Sometimes they're gonna blow you down the stream and it's merrily, merrily, merrily. Life is but a dream, right? Some days the winds are gonna blow you right into a wall. Some days the winds are gonna carry you up the mountain that you never thought you could climb. Some days the winds are gonna ca cause you to come down that mountain and be in a valley and the, wind, the winds of life are gonna blow. But when you trust the sovereignty of God, you literally say, the winds are going to blow, but I'm not going to be moved because I'm in the Father's hands. This is what it means to have fun with holiness. The Bible tells us in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 23, listen, the mercies of the Lord are new every day. You get to wake up to something new from God. And it's his mercy. God doesn't give stale mercy. God doesn't give yesterday's mercy. God doesn't give you somebody else's mercy. He gives you new mercy. Now think about that. And if they're new every day, that means God is limitless, of course. But he's limitless in his supply of new mercy for you every day. You don't wake up and God puts you on hold. And says, there's a lot going on today. I'll get back to you. You don't wake up and find out that God is meeting an emergency session or that God is bewildered or God is distracted. You wake up and God's already ahead of you because the Bible says he never sleeps nor slumbers. He is already there before you, before you ever, before your eyes ever open, before your feet ever hit the ground. The mercies of the Lord are waiting for you every morning. And it's his way of saying, brand new day, brand new start. I'm in control of your entire world. Here's a whole new package of mercy. Enjoy my holiness. Live in my sovereignty. Rest in the Father's hands and leave the rest in the Father's hands. I mean, how much more amazing can you get than that? Well, let me close with Colossians chapter 3. I want to read this to you. It's verses 1 through 17. And give me just a second because it won't be on the screen. It's so much that I want to read it and so John Allen, who's on our worship team, um, he's actually putting together some material to walk our worship team through what he calls a worship team boot camp, and it's phenomenal. It's some assigned reading, it's some scripture memory, and some other things, and I adopted that. And I thought, man, our deacons need to go through this, and some other leaders need to go through this. And one of the things he did was he's assigning the worship team um, to read, read and memorize Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 17. And I read that, and of course, I've read it. I've preached it before, but I thought, that is absolutely perfect for right here. So let me just read it. What I'm about to read to you, if you'll pay attention really closely, it's gonna diagnose for you almost chapter 10 and chapter 11 of Ecclesiastes in a nutshell, in a summary of how you need to live, who you once were, and now you need to live like this. Follow me with this. If you then, having been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On the account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked. He's about to list them. When you were living in them. 
but now you must put them away. Put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you all also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. In other words, trust the sovereignty of God to which you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through What if we live like that every day? What if we got up and said, I'm not going to look at the earth. I'm going to look at God. And I'm going to look above that. And I'm no longer going to be that, which what I was. I'm going to be who I am to be in Christ. And in all of that, I'm going to put on everything that I can put on that was given to me by God, the mercies of the Lord, which are new every morning. And I'm going to rest in the sovereignty of God. I literally live in God's playground and my father is in charge and I've been given this whole world to enjoy. I'm not letting the world rob me of that because the world wants to tell me my God is not in charge. My God is in charge. So I'm going to wake up and live for him every day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That is how you live. That is how you live every day. And before you know it, you're a bright light in a very dark workplace. Instead of waking up Monday morning going, oh, I got to go to work. You're like, I got to go to work. Because God has a hold of my boss. God is touching my coworker. Watch what God is doing here. God, watch your... Now, instead of dreading it, you're resting in the sovereignty of God because nothing is rocking our God. So therefore, nothing will rock your life because you're in the Father's hands. We're in the Father's hands. And if you're not, I want to call you to trust Christ and rest in his hands. Amen. Amen. 